Verse 13. And they bore the child into the palace, and Leotonus said to the king, Behold, a wonder of wonders, I have found an Israelitish child in a basket in the rushes, and only gods know how it came, or how it sealed the walls. The king said, Keep though the child, and it shall be both a brother and a son to thee. Nevertheless, my guards shall find the way my grounds are entered, or blood will be upon them. So here you have... Pharaoh's daughter finding Moses and bringing it to Pharaoh, saying, It shall be a brother and a son to thee. As I stated in Who Was Moses, is referring to Amenahet the third, Sobeknefru, and Amenahet the fourth. So these are the three characters I'm going to be displaying as Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter, and Moses. Verse 4. Now after some days, and when the search had been completed, and no one discovered as to the manner of the child's ingress, the king issued a decree commanding a thousand Israelite male children to be put to death. Moses amongst the rest, unless the mother of the child Moses came and acknowledged as to the manner of ingress. The king alluded three days in which the time the matter should culminate. But nevertheless, the mother came not and acknowledged. Verse 5. And the king, being Amenahet III, called his daughter, being Sobeknefru, and said unto her, What shall be done? Leotonus, the daughter, said, The king's word must not be broken. Nevertheless, thou gives the child to me, saying, Keep thou it, and it shall be a brother and a son to thee. And straightway I sent my maids and procured an Israelitish woman as nurse for the child, and I set my heart upon the child, nor can I part with it and live. Last night I consulted the oracles as to the matter, for I saw that thy mandate must be fulfilled. Now here is the true reason Moses was found in a basket. Book of the Ark of Bond, chapter 15, verse 6 through 12, states, verse 6. The king said, and what said the oracle? Leotonus said, give word abroad that the nurse of the child is its mother. Now I beseech thee, O king, let it be heralded abroad that all is acknowledged. Verse 7. The king seeing the child relented, and word was proclaimed as, as Leotonus had desired. And moreover, the matter was entered in the recorder's house that the mother of the child had made the basket and placed it where it was found, though no reason was assigned therefore. Such then was the Egyptian explanation. And this is the same explanation you can find in the Bible, Exodus chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. But here is the truth behind what really happened. Verse 8. Now the truth of the matter was, the angels of Jehovah came to Yochbed and said, Thy son's name shall be Moses, signifying a leader forth, for he shall deliver the Israelites out of bondage, but he shall be taken from thee, and thou cannot find him, for the angel of Jehovah will deliver him into Leotonus, which is Pharaoh's daughter, and she shall adopt him as her brother and son, and bestow upon him the education of a prince. Verse 9. Yokebed fared, for in those days male children of Israelitish parentage were outlawed, nor could any man be punished for slaying them. And Yokebed prayed Jehovah, saying, Thy will be done, O Jehovah, for I know thy hand is upon my son. But I beseech thee, O Father, that I may come to the princes and be her nurse for the child. The angel of Jehovah said, Swear thou before Jehovah, thou will not betray to the child that thou art his mother. Verse 10, Yochbet said, Though I be commanded by the king, yet will I not own that I am the mother, and it be thy will, O Jehovah. Verse 11, And Jehovah's angels fashioned a basket and carried the child and placed it where it was found by Leotonus and her maids. And Leotonus, seeing it was a Hebrew child, commanded one of her maids to go and bring an Israelitish woman to nurse it. And the maid went out beyond the Utah gate and found and brought Yochbed, the child's mother. But no one knew she was its mother. Verse 12. And when Yochbed had come before the princess, the latter said unto her, Nurse thou the child, for I will be its mother and its sister, for the gods have delivered it into my hands. And Yochbet said, It is a goodly child, I will nurse it for thee. So here is the true reason why Moses was placed in a basket. It was already planned beforehand, but the Egyptians had no clue of what took place. And now in Owaspi, you have the truth behind what really happened. Now, here is the physical description of Moses. Now, in the Bible, it doesn't give you a physical description of Moses. 
but in Oaspi it does. Book of the Ark of Bon, chapter 15, verse 13, it states, verse 13, Moses grew and became a large man, being a pure Ahuin, copper colored and of great strength. And Pharaoh, having no son, bestowed his heart on Moses and raised him as a prince, having provided him men of great learning to teach him. Moses was master of many languages and withal made acquainted with kings and queens and governors far and near. And he espoused the cause of the king whose dominion held seven kingdoms beyond Egypt as tributary kingdoms, which paid taxes to Pharaoh. So here in Owaspi, it clearly states that Moses was a black man. Now here is where Moses reigned as co-regent for 12 years, and then he was removed from office by the nobles of Kemet. On the Turin Canon Papyrus, it gives Moses a Menahet IV, a reign of nine years, just a three-year difference. Now, the book of the Ark of Bon, chapter 15, verse 14 through 20, it states, verse 14, So Pharaoh made Moses ambassador to the foreign kingdoms, in which capacity he served 12 years. But because of the prejudice against him for being of Israelitish blood, the court of the Pharaoh importuned the king for his removal, and Moses was removed from office under the king. So this is the real reason why Moses was removed from ruling in Kemet, or Amenahet IV was ruling in Kemet, or why he had a short reign, because he was removed from office for being an Israelite. The same way that the Europeans may say, we don't want this black man in this high position, remove him. Likewise, verse 15, the king said to Moses, my son, this is a double infliction on me in my old days. In the first place, it is as a sword thrust to cut off my love to thee, lest thou someday become king. And in the second place, it is hard for a pharaoh to be, to be dictated by his own court. Verse 16. Moses replied, Fear not, O king, that my love and thine can be severed. Often it happens that men are tried in a way they know not the wisdom of but which afterward we realized to be the best thing that could have taken place. Verse 14. As for myself, I think this revoke is put upon me by Jehovah, because I labor not for my own people. Verse 18. The king said, How so? Moses replied, For many days a great heaviness hath come upon me. It is as if the wind of heaven bore down on my heart, saying, Moses, Moses, lift up thy voice for thy people. For behold, the king, the father, will favor thee. Verse 19, Pharaoh being a man at the third, said, What would thou, my son? And if it be possible to be done, it shall be done. Verse 20, Moses answered, Until I have gone amongst them and ascertained their grievance, I know not how to answer thee. The king said, Go and keep thy counsel to thyself until thou art returned. Now here is where Moses traveled four months seeing the condition of the Israelites and this would coincide with the expeditions of Amenahet IV at the Serebet El Kadim mines when he went to see the conditions of the workers in the mines. And here are the Sinetic inscriptions to prove the Hebrew Israelites' presence in Egypt during this time. Now, Book of the Ark of Bon, chapter 15, verse 21 through 23 estates, verse 21. So Moses departed and traveled over the land of Egypt and was four months absent and returned unto Pharaoh. And to him Moses related all the grievance of the Israelites, explaining the task put upon them, their denial before the courts, their forbiddance to education, and withal extolled them highly for being a peaceful and virtuous people. Verse 22. The king said, it is a pity, it is a great pity, but what can I do, O Moses? Though behold how even thyself is chastised by the king's court, if I demand the repel of the laws, the court will heap coals of fire on thy head and on mine. Verse 23, Moses said, Neither know I, O king, what to do. And Moses was in great trouble of soul. And afterward he waited a while for his thoughts to come to him. And he said, O king, this night, though... And Leotonus shall reason with me, for I feel it incumbent because of the pressure on my soul. Now here's where Jehovah comes to Moses, his stepfather and his half-sister, to reveal the migration out of Egypt. Book of the Ark of Bond, chapter 15, verse 24 through 26, it states, 24, verse 24. When the three were alone that night, lo and behold, it was the beginning of the dawn of light. 
and Moses' ears were open, and he heard the voice of Jehovah through his angel, saying, verse 25, Behold, O king, and though Leotonus, and though Moses, now is the beginning of my power on the face of the earth. Moses, my son, thou shalt take thy people out of the land of Egypt, and I will bestow upon them the lands of the ancients, even whether I lead thee. Change not thy laws, O king. Let Egypt have her way, and let the Israelites have their way also. Verse 26. The king said, To deliver four millions of people, O oh, what a labor. So here it states the beginning of Jehovah's light. This is referring to the earth entering the 24th arc cycle, the year being 1553 BC, around that time period. And it is this same year that Moses got this revelation. Now here's where they talk about the burning bush. And here's where Moses get instructions to tell the Israelites about the migration. Book of the Ark of Bond, chapter 15, verse 27 through 30, it states, verse 27. On the next day, Moses walked out, going into the woods to be alone, for heavy trouble was upon him. And an angel of Yahweh appeared in a flame of fire in a bush, calling Moses, Moses, my son. And Moses saw that the bush was not burned. And he said, here I am, and I heard thy voice. Verse 28. The voice said, I am the God of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob. Moses said, What would thou? Verse 29. The voice said, Go thou once more amongst thy people and say thou, I, Moses, am come to deliver you out of the land of Egypt and into an inheritance which shall be your own. Verse 30. Moses said, My people will ask of me, by whose authority speaks thou? And what then shall I answer them? The voice said, Say thou to them, The I am sent me. And if they question further, saying, Thou has a deceiving spirit like the Egyptians, then shall thou say to them, How can ye distinguish one spirit from another? And they will say, Whoso laboreth for himself will deceive us. And thou shalt say to them, Whosoever hath faith in Jehovah, let him give up all, even as I do, and let them follow me. For if a multitude go forth in faith in the Father, then will the Father provide unto them. For this is the meaning of faith, from which ye were named Israelites. Now in the Bible, in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 through 15, it states the false accusation of Moses killing an Egyptian. And then Moses received commandments, thou shalt not kill is a total contradiction to his actions. But here is the truth behind this matter. Book of the Ark of Bon. Chapter 15, verse 31 through 34, it states, verse 31. So Moses and his brother Aaron traveled about in the land of Egypt, calling together Rabban families, explaining to them and urging the people to get ready and depart out of Egypt. For three years they thus labored, and it became known far and near that the project was on foot. Verse 32. And the oracles of the Egyptians prophesied that when the Israelites were once out of the country, they would unite with the kingdoms whereto Moses had been ambassador and then return and overpower the Egyptians. Verse 33. And in order to stigmatize Moses, they said he fled away from Pharaoh's palace because he had seen two men an Egyptian and an Israelite fighting and that Moses slew the Egyptian and buried him in the sand and the recorders thus entered the report in the recorded houses. Verse 34, Moses was of tender heart and he inquired of the great spirit saying, will ever a voice of justice speak in my behalf? Jehovah said through his angel, Answer Moses, saying, Suffer thy enemies to put on record what they will, for the time will surely come when the truth shall be revealed unto men. Pursue thy course, for it shall be shown that thou dost still visit the king, wherefore, had thou fled as the record state, thou would not return, with the report hanging over thy head. So here is the clarification that Moses was not a killer. It was allowed by the Egyptians to try to stigmatize the exodus. So here Awaspi is clearing up the lies that was trickled down in the Bible. Here is the environment and condition of Kemet and the different ranks of the people. Book of the Ark of Bond, chapter 15, verse 35 through 41, it states, verse 35, In those days Egypt was a land of glory and of misery. Hardly is it possible for words to describe the splendor in which the nobles lived, of their palaces and chariots, a thousand books might be written, and yet not reveal all. And as to the members of the king's court, 
so grand were they that many of them stood not on the ground for one year's end to the other, but caused carpet to be spread wherever they desired to walk. And as to their chariots, they were bound with silver and gold, and set with precious stones. Verse 36. Of the royal court and the nobles, there were 2,480, and they owned and possessed everything in Egypt, which was the richest country in the world. Verse 37. The next in rank were the masters, who were servants and tenants to the court terriers and nobles. And the third in rank were the faithists called Israelites, who were servants under the masters. Verse 38. And it was against the law for anyone to call a meeting of Israelites or to entice them against servitude to the masters, for which reason Moses and Aaron violated the law of the land, nor dare any man to arrest them because Moses bore with him the king's seal. Verse 39. 